bringing any uh, companions, so uh, you just give me the single one, but the double bed of them. Or two, two, two queens. Okay, is he coming in or what? That's one of my former students there, Dennis Walker, who I mentioned, um, not maybe in this class, but in my other class, he was, um, he worked with us here and he got into Time Magazine, in fact, because of uh, one of the archaeological expeditions we took out to the Dead Sea Cliffs and he represented me and he found some information and uh, so I got his picture in Time Magazine and um, I think he was happy about that. <laughs> I don't think I ever got my picture in Time Magazine, so... Where are we? We are um, Peter's Tablecloth Vision, right? Somewhere around that point. So, um, the voice cries out to Peter on chapter 10, 14. Kill, eat. Peter says, I have never eaten any unclean or profane thing. So now, according to this, do we disagree? I mean, this presentation implies Peter is keeping what we have to refer to as Jewish dietary laws. Is that fair enough? Anyone disagree with that? So, if Peter is keeping Jewish dietary laws at this point, Either he misunderstood uh, Jesus' message, or Jesus didn't regulate that issue in his life. And my position is that from the evidence in Galatians, the issue has not been regulated. But the Gospels don't agree with that. The Gospels claim the issue was regulated. Does everyone agree with that, where we are so far on that position? I mean, do you know what we're talking about? Anyone, even if you're a believer or not a believer, you agree that there's the data. That's what the data is saying. That the issue, what is the issue? Well, whether you must keep dietary regulations, whether you must follow the Mosaic Law, whether you must, uh, you know, separate holy from profane, whether you must, uh, you know, separate polluted from impure and clean from unclean. And up to this point, even Acts author admits Peter is doing this, keeping dietary regulations, separating holy from profane. And never has not done it, according to this. Now, I mean, you know, I'm not a big believer in Acts. You all have learned that, and uh, you can agree or disagree with me, right? Uh, whether you feel that's appropriate, but you know, I'm the upfront about that. I, I don't credit Acts, historically speaking, too strongly. I think there's history underlying it, as I've said, but I don't think that the way it presents it is um, free of an agenda. So even with the agenda, let's say I'm correct, maybe I'm not correct, maybe the other side of it is Acts is totally true, everything that happened, happened. And some of you may agree to think that, and you're certainly about to do that, and it's certainly a much more pleasant thing to feel that way. Faith is easier in that regard. Uh, your situation in your church, whatever, is uh, more uh, easily uh, dealt with, and you can feel more comfortably spiritually speaking. So, so that, there's nothing wrong with that position. It is a religious position. Um, but even if you have that position, that you feel everything is true and so on and so forth, you, you, you will admit that even with Acts' point of view, whatever it is, Acts acknowledges here that Peter was keeping Jewish dietary regulations. Okay, anyone, there's nobody, faith or not faith, that can deny that point, right? So from that point, then you have to say, why was he doing this if Jesus wasn't? Uh, well, you see, that's the big question. So my solution might be different from yours. You don't have to be where I am. I'm 60, so most of you are in your 20s. You got 40 years to get as cynical as me. So look, if I'm cynical, just envision what you may become 40 years from now, and you're not, okay? You disagree with me, that's fair enough. So just realize that I was once like you. I believed everything. I, I believed everything that was told me. I believed all these materials. 
I, I thought I just tried to figure out how it could all be the way it was being presented. But later on in life, as Paul says, when I was young, I, uh, I, I saw as through a glass darkly. When I grew up, I put away childish things. That's to some extent what I did. Maybe I shouldn't have. Maybe it's more fun to be like, I was laughing in my other class about Jason Timberlake, and then they told me his name was Justin Timberlake. So, you know, I found out that my classes knew more about Justin Timberlake than they knew about the Black Hills of South Dakota. So uh, maybe it's more fun to be like that. Just accept the world as it's given you and know about all the icons of your present age and not go deeper into it than, than that and life is, can be more pleasant. But when we take a course like this, as we said, we sometimes need to, you know, go deeper. And that's my apology to you. If I've hurt your feelings or upset you or said things that uh, you find stressful and so on, it's only by trying to get at the deeper meaning and see what, if we can find out what, not so, for, not so much for a religious point of view, though I think there is a religious meaning to it all. I am, as I told you, a Jamesian in the sense that I think James's approach to things was more authentically Palestinian and more Jesus-like than the overseas person we call Paul with the Roman citizenship. So um, I think people today are more interested in pure foods. I think people today are more interested in having some kind of dietary uh, uh, differentiation between clean and unclean. I think people are more interested in separating holy from profane. I think people want to do that, and they miss that. And, uh, and I think that um, maybe we don't want to go all whole hog. I mean, look, I eat shrimp, lobster, I eat pork, I eat meat with blood in it and stuff like that, but maybe we don't want to go as, as extreme as some of the, you know, but those people, as we said last time, were operating under the taboos of their time in the scientific knowledge that they had. And uh, they knew that blood was, uh, was a worrisome thing, they knew that pork had trichinosis. They knew, knew that bottom feeding fish were dangerous and you could get uh, you know, um, um, different diseases from the, those things and they put it in the, in the area of a taboo as we said. So maybe they were too extreme, but on the other hand, I think the opposite might be too extreme too. So to go back to the Jamesian position to my mind would be a healthy thing perhaps for some people in the modern age. So I have no apologies to make on trying to rescue James out of the obscurity here. We certainly agree that he's here, he's in the background, but he's not coming into the foreground yet. The next chapter he will start to. In any case, here's the historical Peter. So even according to Acts, Peter never ate any unclean thing before this vision. But that, does that agree with Galatians? No. Paul presents Peter as a swing figure. Now, do we have the same person? Is Cephas the same as Peter? Now, we all know what the Cephas problem is, right? And we've already discussed that sufficiently, that sometimes Peter's called Cephas, which is the Aramaic word for rock. Sometimes he's called uh, 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 Peter, which is the Greek word for rock. And uh, other times he's called Simon. So it's hard to get a handle on, you know, if these were all the same person or if they were different people by these names. And so um, even Paul sometimes calls him Cephas, and sometimes calls him Peter. So are they the same? Most people say yes, but maybe there were two different Peters, I don't know. In any case, this Peter here is not the Peter in Galatians, in the sense that the Peter in Galatians, Paul calls what? A hypocrite. He says, I know you used to eat with Gentiles, meaning he ate impure foods. Is that clear? That's what it means by that. You can't table fellowship. And now when the representative of James came down, you stopped doing this which also, as we agreed, or at least I felt was the proper conclusion, meant that James was the head honcho. That, against, that flies against all doctrine, doesn't it? <coughs> I don't think there's any church in the universe that acknowledges that James is the head honcho. Has anyone ever heard that in their church, that James is the boss? But it's in the book. It's in the literature. That's the weird thing. It's right in the book, and yet no one can... Uh, Acknowledges what stops people from acknowledging it? Uh, because doctrine, doctrine stops it. They're held back by a doctrinaire position. If they step beyond that doctrine, they feel they're in some sort of um, heretical, ideological trouble. Whatever church, whether it's your church or another church. But if you're a free person without being under the um, 
under the authority of a doctrine, then you can let your mind move freely if you feel you should, and at a university we're supposed to. That's what we're supposed to be free. Uh, if we didn't have free inquiry at a university, we'd be, be back with putting Galileo, Galileo in prison, you know, <laughs> for saying that what we all now accept is obvious, that the earth moved around the sun and the sun didn't move around the earth, you know. And yet he was silenced for 10 years of his life and put under house arrest for having uh, adopted that position of the previous person who said Copernicus. So, um, and, uh, so we'd all be like that if we couldn't think freely. We have to be able to think freely. So maybe a time is coming when we'll get out from under some of this doctrine too. And that uh, things will uh, swing more over towards um, a fair picture, which I think is in the text. You say, what, is it in the text? It's in the early church fathers. James was elected leader of the early church. We read that from three different sources in the early church fathers. Even someone as rabid as Eusebius cannot fail to record it. And the pseudo-Clementine literature, of course, is not even a question. James is over Peter, and we even have um, a letter or a uh, presentation of Peter uh, saying that if you don't go according to James's doctrine, you are not a proper apostle. And that's in, uh, so I don't accept the pseudo -Clemides. Well, it's as good as this material here, so I don't see why you should or shouldn't. That's up to you, but we have a lot of evidence. So here, we have a Peter who's even more extreme than the Peter in Galatians. So Acts is not always reliable. Certainly now, the tablecloth vision is the kind of vision that uh, is not in the realm of history. We most would agree with that. More in the realm of literature. Anyone feel that you know that's an unfair statement? I mean, you can criticize. That, I don't mind, but I mean, literature. Okay, uh, lots of things are literary. Uh, this is good. If you've got the James book, I have that quote from. Um, I have that quote from. Um, because I left it out of my original, so I stuck it in here someplace. I want to mark up your book, but uh, that quote from um, uh, the Clement and Homilies, uh, Peter speaking, Our Lord and Prophet who has sent us, Jesus being the true prophet, declared us that the evil one, the devil, I guess, that disputed with him forty days, but failed to prevail against him, promised he would send apostles from among his subjects to deceive them, deceiving apostles. Therefore, above all, remember, remember to shun any apostle teacher, this is Peter speaking, or prophet, who does not accurately compare his teaching with that of James, the brother of my Lord, and this even if he comes to you with recommendations. So, <laughs> you can say that's a lie, but there is a data attesting to that, and uh, we have to take that into consideration. So. The pseudo clementines say that you're not even allowed to teach if you can't compare your 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 doctrines with James's. And we don't even know in California who James is before some of us start agitating this behalf. And if you go to your churches, whatever church you are, and you start talking about him, some will be aware of the present debate, which we've helped to initiate. But others will. Who's he? Right? Isn't that true? You go and you say something. Oh, about James, brothers. You say who? who? Who's that person? Many people in academia don't know who James is. Come on, you're kidding me. Well, I'm sure in the other departments. You mean in this in this field too? Or just in general? Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> well, that's the problem. That's why they can't do scroll studies, because they don't know the history of the early church. They don't know what the disputes were in the early church. How can someone in rabbinic studies do scroll studies when he's totally ignorant of the early church uh, problems? Or, I, I have first-hand knowledge. Uh, you went to the University of Chicago when you found that out. Huh? And that's why he went back to his uh, his delivery route and uh, got out from under some of these academic people that he felt were too heavy. This is Dennis Walker. He used to be like you guys 10 years ago. Or longer, actually. Any case, uh, Dennis first went out with us to the digs back in 1989 or so. Is this boring you, Dennis? Or no, 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 no. Okay, so. the fresh air. Oh, okay, so you come back and have some. So in any case, uh, Whatever we want to say, Peter is either a swing figure or he's totally, you know, opposed to the old line. 
And then we get this a vision here that is really what I would consider to be the polarization of Peter. Because what Peter basically learns is that not to make distinctions between pure and impure. But he doesn't learn it in his lifetime from Jesus. Now, Acts agrees with that. The Gospels don't agree with that. The Gospels say Jesus taught these things. Uh, you say, well, where do you go? Well, you know I'm a prejudiced person, so obviously I owe to the, the side that doesn't take the gospel side. But, I mean, I don't mean to be conceived of as being preconceived. It's just that life has taught me that the gospel presentation are not always reliable. And now people will say, well, that flies totally in the face of my faith. And I understand that. And um, uh, the problem is that the other evidence that I've begun to have been in, uh, encountered led me to take a lesser, less optimistic view of the Gospels than I might used to have had. And now other people who are younger or haven't looked at other evidence have a more optimistic view, and um, that's fair enough until you see the other evidence. And this is an place in point. Uh, if, I, 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 if the Gospels have it right, then Peter is an ignoramus, and I don't consider him an ignoramus. So there's something wrong, and you'll have to decide for yourself. We've done it. We've harped enough on that. Okay, so the point of the whole vision is so Peter can do what? Enter the house of a Roman centurion. Do you think anyone, from the little we've talked in this class about the Dead Sea Scrolls, would ever have um, entered the house of a Roman centurion from the Dead Sea Scrolls, say? I don't think that would be even conceivable in their mind. That would be about the last, so you say, I know it's hard to understand Palestine without, but you see, the scrolls that are like a, a capsule in the caves, a time capsule, come back and given us a view of the ideological position of a lot of these maybe more extreme groups, maybe groups, as I've said, somewhat like the Ayatollah Khomeini maybe even, uh, but in any case, uh, they are the extreme groups. And they are messianic too, and they're interested in the coming of the Messiah, or whether he came already or not is not clear. <coughs> but uh, they're very messianic, and they're very extreme, and they're very purity-minded, and they all, their new covenant is based on separating holy from profane. That's exactly what they say. The new covenant in the land of Damascus to separate the holy from the profane. So it's just the exact opposite of this. And I've learned that so much is it the opposite, but I think one is actually being written against the other because they're mirror opposites. Now, people who do scroll studies, as you know, and I'm somewhat well known in that field, fortunately or unfortunately, notorious or unnotorious, uh, like to portray me as someone saying the scrolls are Christian because if you can make your opponent look stupid, then you can easily cut him down. So they like to put me into a cubbyhole and then they can laugh at this. But you see, it's much more complex than that. I don't say the scrolls are Christian at all, but we, we have to be able to speak. So the scrolls are what Christianity, quote, might have been in Palestine before it went overseas and was polarized. That's the position, and the position to know what Christianity, in quotes, was in Palestine, or what the Essenes were, if you prefer, and I think the Essenes and the proto-Christians are the same group, what the Essenes and the proto-Christians were, you have to go to documents like the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then the Dead Sea Scrolls um, have uh, uh, just the opposite of this. Plus, the scrolls would never go into the house of a Roman century. So this whole thing is being set up. In my view, the authors are setting it up because this is not a historical episode. It's a literary episode. We all agree that Tablecloths from Heaven is a literary episode. Uh, so that Peter gets a position like Paul to do the Gentile mission, even to Roman centurions, even the most extreme case, a Roman centurion. Now, was there ever a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius? Was there ever a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius? Well, now, if we take Acts as a testimony, our answer is yes. But if we feel that Acts is more literary here, then we might call this symbolic. And I've given you one reason why I think Cornelius, the name, may represent more than we think. Two reasons. One, he's from what regiment? The Italica regiment. 
that can be translated in some Gospels, which is why you need to go to the Greek as Italian. But in fact, it isn't Italian in, in Greek. It's Italica in Spain, the name of this city in Spain, the Romans founded in southern Spain, where the future Roman emperors, Nerva, Trajan, and Hadrian came from. And to my mind, that's the reason why he's presented as coming from that regiment to sort of ingratiate these documents to people from that background. I may be wrong, that's just a theory. So that's one thing that makes me worry about how historical this character, there were legionnaires certainly in Caesarea, but was it the Italica regiment? I'd have to do some real digging to find out if it was the Italica regiment. Josephus says they were Syrophoenicians, the legionnaires there from, from Syria. And they were really nasty people and they go to the Jews to revolt and as I told you, when, uh, when Titus uh, destroyed Jerusalem and burned the temple, that was the first unit that he banished from Palestine. Now they must have been pretty bad if they were even banished by the Roman conqueror from Palestine as people who had, were hated by the population and had uh, caused the tremendous distress to the point of provoking the population to, rebel, uh, to uh, insurgent activity. So you see, this is a legionnaire from that contingent. And he's supposed to be someone who is a lover of Jews. This to me is just, just, it, it, it just hurtful to me personally. I just don't, I can't conceive that this is accurate. Now you maybe think it is. There was such a guy. There's a U.S. Marine captain who loves the Sunni insurgents. Uh, please find him for me. I want to meet him. <laughs> and who gives liberally to Sunni insurgent causes, gives to Islamic charities, and his charities, and is well spoken of by the whole Jewish people. That flies in a non Palestinian environment. You see, Rome, Hellenistic, but it, 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 so anyway, we've been through all this. Well, in any event, I told you about the, it, it, this is for Dennis's benefit since he's here. The constant um, emphasis on his deeds, his works being remembered before God, line 31. After Cornelius, Cornelius was fasting for, I think, four days. He's a, he's a Roman centurion who's fasting. And uh, in the Damascus document, it says, And a book of remembrance would be written out for God-fearers. At the end of the Damascus document. That's uh, what the exhortation says. You haven't seen that document. It's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the most important document. But to me, all those references to he, his deeds were remembered before God relates to those kind of passages in the Damascus document. And the God-fearers in the Damascus document of Qumran are a contingent of Gentile believers who are attached to the community of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, which to my mind parallels this early Christian community, but is the opposite side of the coin. The law purity-minded, and uh, separating holy from profane, extremely um, purity-conscious. So, um, Peter says in 35, so in every nation, he who fears God, there's the god fear language, uh, and works righteousness is acceptable to him. So we have the new position of the early church now. It's not come into the covenant first and then you can have these promises but anyone who is a god fear so this is directed at god fears and you have to know that god fear is the going parlance for people associated with the synagogues around the mediterranean who have come into the um, so-called jewish orbit but are at a kind of an associated status still and uh, that's what I think we're getting here. And that's what we have in the Damascus document. That's another one of my theories that you're familiar with, and I think that's accurate. Now, this idea that God is not a respecter of persons, we already saw in the um, presentation of uh, James as a person, in line 34 of chapter 10 here. Uh, in any case, uh, so Peter is uh, uh, meets Cornelius. Now, the name, uh, finally, of Cornelius, I told you, we know he's a centurion. We know he's a Roman soldier of the Caesarean contingent. It's supposed to be Italica. Cornelius, I thought, went back because I've come upon the importance of the Lex Cornelia 
the Sicarios e Beneficis. I'm not a good Latin student, you're probably better. Uh, but in any case, it's the Roman tradition of law. It's a whole body of legislation having to do with bodily mutilations like circumcision. In other words, the Romans saw circumcision as a bodily mutilation like castration, as I told you. This was the body of legislation, and it was uh, attributed for the fourth time, as I told you, to someone called Cornelia Cornelius. So to my mind, that's where he gets the name Cornelius from. Now, I may be wrong, and this all may be the opposite. Okay, I'm not saying this is theory, it's just a theory. And you have to weigh if it, you think it's applicable or not. And that then would relate it to the previous material about the Ethiopian Queen's eunuch. The author of Acts is a very subtle person, or persons, and he knows very well the arguments of the time. He knows what's going on. He knows that circumcision, as we know from Galatians, is the big issue even in the Christian community. Not among Jews, they were doing it anyway, like Muslims do, and Arabs do, and everyone does in the Middle East. Okay, that, that's not a big issue. It's just done, just a matter of routine. It's the big issue in the Pauline mission situation. Because uh, for Paul to move in the Gentile world, the, the circumcision is, is a huge impediment. <laughs> How are you going to take someone who's 35 years old and say you've got to be circumcised without anesthesia? Are you kidding me? This is like a huge impediment. And, and why should I be circumcised? Because the Old Testament said that that's the sign of the covenant. Now, now it's maybe just dumb, superstitious, taboo. It's of no consequence. Forget the medical or non-medical things. Egyptians used it. Semitic peoples took it as a religious thing. So the Jews, like them or not, had this as something that was like baptism, if you want. But if you're going to convert people to a Judaic type of mystery religion, not one having to do with Mithra or uh, Osiris or uh, some other uh, Eastern Orpheus cult, but a Jesus cult based on Hebrew scripture, then the issue of circumcision becomes front and center. So Paul has to deal with that. And he does in Galatians head on. He says, no, absolutely not. Don't do it but the James party are insisting on it. Now, does anyone doubt what I'm saying on that issue? How do we know it? Because Paul tells me the party of the circumcision, the sum from James, came down. So we know that they were insisting on these things. And he then spends the rest of Galatians in a huge emotional outpouring against circumcision. Do you mean like Paul was circumcised? I think he says he was, yeah, in one of his letters, Philippians. And then Acts says he has some of his other people circumcised so that he doesn't have to deal with this issue. And then the cry is that he brings uncircumcised people into the temple and that's what causes the riot in the temple. It would be like going to Mecca and not being a Muslim and trying to sneak into the Hajj. I mean, these people are fanatics, let's face it. I'm not trying to excuse them, say they're wonderful people. I'm just trying to recreate the, the, the picture better than Mel Gibson does. <laughs> any case uh, so that's all we're trying to do uh, for better or for worse so okay that's my explanation of Cornelius' name that these people know a lot more than you know or I knew and they're very subtle and they're extremely uh, able purveyors of the position that they're interested in um, well, I hate to say proselytizing but, uh, you know, um, promoting across the whole Mediterranean. And I do honestly believe that they were successful. They knew what they were doing. They knew the people they were dealing with. I mean, if you were to go to an ad agency today, or, uh, you know, one of the famous uh, Madison Avenue ad agencies and said, get me a promotional campaign for a certain thing, that uh, this is the thing, a uh, product I, I want to, uh, you know, move around and get to be widespread. I don't know if you say why. I, don't, I have no idea what move these people. The, the, the people who wrote this document were as effective as any Madison Avenue ad agency. They knew what they were doing, they knew the force they were dealing with, and they this is how they presented their data, and it's been totally effective, not only effective, it's lasted for 2,000 years, and I'm sure long beyond you and me, 2,000 years from now, it'll still be out there. That's, you can't do much better than that. That's one of the most powerful uh, marketing promotional document that you could possibly have. Uh, 
So, I mean, and this picture is going to long, whatever I say that counterindicates it will be lost in the torrent of uh, <laughs> the historical flood that this thing rides upon. It has no bearing whatsoever. But for our purposes, it's fun. We only live once. We like to use our heads. So we try to analyze the material. And so we're always talking about Cornelius and if it relates to the Lex Cornelia to Sicarius. And the other important thing is the Lex Cornelia to Sicarius mentions the word Sicarius, which we now begin to realize is a more and more important thing. At one point in Acts 21, Paul is going to be asked by a Roman centurion, are you a Sicari? Are you one of those Sicari that went into the wilderness? And Acts is actually going to use the word Sicari to refer to Paul. And Paul says, oh, no, no, not me. But others were. And I think Sicari is a name for the circumcision party. Why? Because I think that's how the Romans referred to, to the circumcision. Because of the knife they used to circumcise themselves. That's way beyond where I was when they used it. And uh, that's, that knife was double as an assassin's knife and a circumciser's knife. Josephus chooses to give us the assassin part of it and chooses to conceal the other implications. So, going back to Paul, Galatians 2, am I losing you? Some from James came down, and Peter, who used to eat with Gentiles, and Barnabas with him, was no longer uh, willing to do this, withdrew from this situation. Barnabas copied him in this hypocrisy, and they no longer basically uh, 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 agreed with me. And I withstood them to their face and told them, you know, that they were hypocrites and blah, 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 blah. But they uh, were under the James authority and I was not. And uh, so, uh, this is not James, the brother of John, it's James, the brother of Jesus, so that's important. Um, these people, Paul also calls the party of the circumcision, or those of the circumcision. And, it's not, and, and it also at one point says, we agreed in Jerusalem that they would go to the circumcision and I would go to the uncircumcision. But the Roman word for circumcision is Sicarius in some way. Lex Cornelia de Sicarius is the word. Uh, I never realized this until a couple of years back when I came upon uh, Oregon, who was an early church father. And I didn't realize that these things were uh, so uh, big in the uh, early years of the church. Oregon apparently castrated himself. And uh, therefore, the people who laughed at Oregon for doing this called him a Sicarius because he had castrated himself. And uh, it's, again, I think Jerome who's laughing at him and saying that he, uh, you know, he misunderstood uh, um, the passage in the Gospel of John or other Gospels saying, make yourself eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. He took that literally, making yourself into a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven. Oregon, and they call, he said he was a Sicarius. So the minute I saw that, I realized that Sicarii had to do not only with um, terrorism, but circumcision. So if you're um, just like, I'm sure the Bin Laden party in Iraq or the insurgents in Iraq don't call themselves um, terrorists. They have a better word for that. They call themselves maybe holy martyrs. So just as outside people will refer to you by a negative word, inside people will use a positive word. So even though outside people are referring to these groups as Sikari, terrorists, Inside groups may be calling themselves um, holy ones, Kiddoshim, or Essenes, or something like that, or Notzrim, Nazareans, or some other word, you know, an honorable title. So you have to understand there's inside vocabulary and outside vocabulary. So I, uh, the inside vocabulary might be the party of the circumcision. Outside might have called them Sakari. Another thing you didn't know when you were in my old classes is that I found another source, Hippolytus, who has a version of Josephus, which he says there are four groups of, of Essenes. Josephus says there are four groups of Essenes, but he doesn't say that they differ very much except in minor things. 
uh, Hippolytus says there are four groups of Essenes, two of them are called Sakari Essenes and Selad Essenes. And that to me, and the, 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 and, and, and the main characteristic of the Sakari Essenes was, if they came upon someone discussing the law who was not circumcised, basically they did like Muslims do, they offered them circumcision or death, the way Islam offers them Islam or death. In other words, they felt like an extreme Muslim today sees a Westerner talking about a Sharia law, he wants to cut their throat. Uh, these groups, I'm not, again, these groups, according to Hippolytus, if they found someone um, uh, talking about the law who was not circumcised, they would threaten him with death or circumcision. So they forcibly circumcised people. Such groups would be called Sikari. And Hippolytus calls them that, but he says they're also Essenes. And he also says these Sicari Essenes took part in the war against Rome, this war against Rome from 66 to 70 AD, and the main thing that they were prepared to die for, have martyrdom for, is they would not, you could torture them, kill them, rack them, do anything to them, but they would not blaspheme the lawgiver. Moses, they would not say bad thing about Moses, and they would no, they refused to eat things sacrificed to idols, and they refused to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, in the received Josephus, he has that he doesn't call them Sakari Essenes, but he said that they would not blaspheme the lawgiver, and they refused to eat forbidden things. Now, in that sense, Hippolytus, you see, they're a little bit different. Hippolytus is a little more precise than our received Josephus. And I think Hippolytus is actually based on an earlier version of Josephus that did not circulate in the West or was a different version, maybe a more forthcoming version. Because I don't think Hippolytus, or a, 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 a Roman Christian theologian of the third century, could have had this material and invented it himself. You follow me? It had to come from an earlier source. So look at that. We're going to come upon things sacrificed to idols in a minute. Where are we going to come upon it? In James' instructions to overseas communities. Now he's saying that the Sicarii Essenes, they were willing to die for that point. About to eat things sacrificed to idols. So I think that's what we're up against here with the party of the circumcision. These are, so I've gone that far. So this is getting very complicated, Professor Arsene. Yeah, I guess it is. But it all has to do with the Cornelius. Who's Cornelius? What's his name? Is there a Roman centurion called Cornelius of the Italica Regiment? Or is this a name that we get from different areas? So that's for you to decide. I, I like my presentation, but it's just a theory. Makes it for fun. Think about it. Let's go on. So, in any case, he's a god fearer, and god fearers are now going to be accepted. Now, um, Peter um, makes the usual accusation in line 39. We are all witnesses of these things which he, Jesus, did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Uh, and now that's really interesting, if that's accurate. Peter sounds like he doesn't, he's not even a Jew here. We're in the, like the Jews are some foreign people. Like if you were an American, would you be out there saying, we're all witnesses to what John Kennedy did in the country of the Americans? <laughs> you know, it sounds like you're not even an American. Uh, or in Jerusalem whom they hang like Peter is some, some other kind of creature here. Again, I think that's the Greek voice writing this in Peter's name. I don't think that this is this historical Peter, as I told you. Now you're going to hate me or not over and over again on this issue, depending on your own creed. Or you can feel it's a challenge, or you can think it's interesting. However, that is the fourth blood libel or the fifth blood libel in Peter's mouth who the Jews killed by hanging him on a tree. The Jews killed him by crucifying him. But the Jews didn't crucify people. The Jews were forbidden to crucify people. So, you know, I mean, this is my problem here with these problem with these issues. Anyway, this is the pretty straightforward doctrine, who they raised up on the third day. That's the straight uh, theological doctrine that we know again. And he is the one appointed by the God to judge the quick and the dead, 42. And all the prophets bear witness to his name. And he also gives remission of sins. 
And as Peter was speaking this lecture to, who is he giving this lecture to? The God-fearers in, 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 in Cornelius' household, right? The Holy Spirit came down on them. So now the Holy Spirit comes down on the God-fearers. <coughs> so this is a huge episode of the table. <coughs> the um, descent of the heavenly table. Well, and it ends up with the Holy Spirit not only descending earlier, we had it on the Jerusalem community, right? It was in chapter 1 or 2. Uh, now it's on God fears in uh, Caesarea. And it was poured out on the Gentiles too. So that's it. That's total um, authorization that this is the proper way to go. So this book is for that, right? So this is a pro-Holy Spirit Gentile mission book. Again, I'm not against it. It's uh, up to you if you think it's accurate or not. Um, that's the position of the book. No one can deny that's the position of the book. Whether it's the accurate picture of the history, you have to decide. Uh, so, baptism comes into the play just as in the eunuch episode. So, um, it ends then in chapter 10, like the eunuch episode. And I think they are connected in some way, as I've told you. And the circumcision, as you see, is very important. The, so those of the circumcision, you see, they, they, are, they appear here in 45. They don't like what's going on. You see that? And they're like the people in Galatians who don't like what's going on in, uh, in Antioch. So they appear as in Galatians. And they were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. Gentiles as well. Chapter 11. Peter then goes up to Jerusalem and the circumcision guys got up there before. So I'm not wrong that circumcision is a big deal here. Anyone disagree with that one? Okay. So the circumcision guys get up there before him. And this is Acts picture. For Acts, does Acts like the circumcision guys? No. What are they for Acts? Troublemakers. People who got the message people who are, you know, you know, people who are, uh, complainers. And, um, isn't that how Paul portrays them in Galatians? Yeah. Does Paul like them? No. But in Galatians, he's forced to admit that they are the dominant party and they are from James. Right? Okay. So I think that we have to understand that this is Acts' portrayal of the James party here, even though James hasn't even been mentioned yet. So they go up there to Jerusalem, and what do they do? They start complaining about what happened down there in um, Jaffa and in um, Caesarea. Just like the people overseas come back to Jerusalem probably as Paul is preaching, and complain about what he's preaching overseas. And we know that that's happening, right? So I think that's Acts' way of representing the first episode of this kind. Of, you, you follow me? Okay, so Peter gets up there and explains the whole thing again. I was in the city of Joppa, five, line 5, and I heard a voice crying out from heaven, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And the voice said a second time, What God has made clean, do not make common. We've now we got the message, now we know what this is about. Do not make issues over purity. Do not separate holy from profane. And this is the groundwork you need for the Pauline Gentile mission. You can't get anywhere in Lebanon, Asia Minor, Italy, Spain, Polynesia, Africa, uh, Ireland, Slovakia, uh, Eskimo land without dealing with this issue. You're not going to get any. You're going to make all those people. Islam did. But how did Islam do it? Armies. Conquered. Islam didn't do it because it sent out proselytizers. Islam sent out armies and then they just converted everybody. And you know where the big clashes occurred for Islam was Persia and in India. And India is not resolved to this day. India is three quarters Hindu and uh, or two thirds Hindu, one third uh, Muslim or three quarters into one quarter Muslim taking Pakistan into the uh, equation and they don't like each other 
they don't like each other because the Muslims tried to impose all their regulations on Hindus. And the Hindus reacted to violent. You, people think Hindus are peaceful. They're not peaceful. The Hindus are quite violent. Uh, the British found that out in the uh, rebellions they had in the 19th century. They called them tugs, which is where we get the word what from? Thug. And what they would do is they would slit people's throats on the highways for Kali, the goddess of death or whatever. They had death cults uh, in Hinduism that they were killing uh, travelers and so on. And, you know, the British had to send their armies out there. To, it was really tough. That Sepoy revolt, things like that. The Hindus, when they get worked up, they'll rip down Muslim temples. And we just saw it in our own time. The extreme Hindu parties ripped. They assassinated Gandhi, the extreme Hindu parties. They thought he was being too uh, soft. So, uh, you know, the Hindus can be very aggressive. The Sikhs are the war party of the Hindus. They're not Hindus anymore. They've gone sort of uh, warrior uh, sort of behavior. But they were originally Hindus, and then they, they become this other group called Sikhs. And all they are really are fighting Hindus, very warrior-like Hindus. So Islam encountered people that resisted militarily. And that is the, that's where Islam, so Islam can impose different things like circumcision, but only militarily. You see what I'm trying to say? But uh, you can't do it just by proselytization. That's my honest analysis of it. It's maybe childish. You have to think about it. So this is a big issue if you're just sending about traveling, uh, traveling teachers to make some headway, let's say, in Asia Minor. You've got the enlightenment. And Paul obviously understood that. This book has hoped to a point inside that Jerusalem leadership was not interested, I think, in proselytization. As Judaism isn't today. Judaism does not proselytize. You know, people go to become part of Judaism and the rabbis are instructed to reject turning back. And I've had people who come to me and say, no, you know, the rabbi, I went to the rabbi and he said he didn't want to talk to me about conversion. And I said, oh, well, that's just because he's testing you. He wants you to come back. He's been told you have to come back three times before he'll, uh, before he'll entertain your your request. And these people, they do it and, they're, uh, and they think they're being um, given the cold shoulder and they're being uh, uh, treated badly. And they don't realize that the guy who's treating them that way, I'm not for proselytization or non-proselytization, I'm just trying to tell you a fact. I heard this, uh, my daughter told me a story of meeting some people in Oxford who were Christian fundamentalists who wanted to convert to Judaism and they were upset because they were rejected and they didn't realize that the rabbi has to do that in Judaism. So Judaism is a non-proselytizing religion. Uh, whether it was originally that at this time, I don't know. But the point is that they're not anxious to proselytize. And the Jerusalem leadership, I don't think, was understood the, the, the implications of a worldwide movement among Gentiles. The way someone like Paul, who had a Roman citizen who had traveled the Mediterranean, understood. Now you say, what about Jesus Christ? Well, the question is who Jesus Christ was in your mind. Is he a person? Is he a real historical character? Is he a superman? Is he a god? Is he a supernatural being? And that will then inform you on how you think Jesus would have thought of this. If he's just a Palestinian peasant, then he would not have been very much aware of the implications of a worldwide Gentile movement, if you must forgive me, if that's how you see him as, a, as a, just a Galilean sort of local teaching impressive person. If you see him as a more supernatural, then of course he can be aware of anything. Is the Jewish movement the Crusaders? Well, they were somewhat, some of them. I'm talking about these God-fearers. Yeah, well, I think they were somewhat. But, you know, it wasn't something that was high on the agenda. Uh, you know, I mean, some were, some weren't. But I don't think they were, I think the god were coming because they were interested in it. I don't think they were looking for it. I think that's more like what it was that they, if you're living in a place like in the Roman Empire and you're in a town, I don't know what, um, Ephesus or something, you see some Jews in a synagogue and you like the way they're doing things, that they're not, you know, bowing down before idols and doing all kinds of things that you find a little bit silly and they seem to be interested in righteousness and pure foods and things, so then you come and start listening at the synagogues and get pulled into their orbit. Uh, but I don't think they were out there trying to pull you in there. a lot. I mean, that's yeah. so it's a legitimate question, but it's something you'd have to investigate in a in a in a, in a research. Or something. How about Jesus?
how much was were the Jews interested in proselytization, or were people actually just coming because they were attracted by it? If you judge by modern Judaism, then they're not very interested in proselytization. Uh, they don't have a worldwide mission like the Mormons. I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. Okay, so anyway, so uh, the, the guy, uh, this is on the party of the, against the circumciser. So that's against the, the, the party of the circumcision. So Peter tells them this whole thing and everything that happened to him. And then in 18, the conclusion is, and hearing these things, they were silent and glorified God, saying, truly God has given the re repentance of life to the Gentiles too. So according to this, everyone is happy. Everyone's getting along fine, right? We have harmony, everyone accepts Peter's view and so on, but Galatians doesn't present a picture like that. And Galatians is after this. So even though everything is resolved here according to this picture, which you will agree, agree is a pro-Pauline picture, and it may be the truth, but it's still a pro-Pauline picture, Galatians, is, it does not, the, 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 there is not harmony in any way yet on these issues. We're about to get into the Pauline missionary activity for the rest of Acts. Uh, we have one more thing to go, and that is the introduction of James. And that will come against the background of a third thing we've been following in this class from Eusebius. Remember? Famine relief. Who's the famine relief person in Eusebius? Queen Helen of Adiabene and her sons, who are converts to Judaism, according to Josephus. Now they may not have been. The Judaism they were converted to may have been a peculiar form of Judaism. Because as we, re as you will remember, it's in the Antiquities. If you want to go read it, he has the Antiquities here. And I'm really jealous of him because I had that book and it's missing now. And I'm going to go find my copy because that was a really good collection that he's got there. But you can get it in used bookstores. I'm still looking for my book. In the Antiquities, not in the war. Uh, but um, you see me as quotes parts of it. He's aware of it. There are some teachers out in uh, northern Iraq, northern Syria, the present-day Kurdistan, on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which we're now all familiar with, that get in and Helen is the queen of these people uh, east of this place called Edessa, which is in northern Syria where this young lady's uh, forebears come from and um, is uh, where the king of the Edessenes seemed to hold uh, sway. And Eusebius, as we remember, called him Agbarus or Abgarus. And he was the king of the peoples beyond the Euphrates, Edessa being on the Euphrates, basically, and these other areas being east of the Euphrates. But he was still holding sway up to where the Persians would have been. And I say to you that I think Queen Helen was part of, under his control, that Adiabene was not a really independent country at that time, but was connected to the land of the Edessenes and the, and the rulers at Edessa. And in fact, Edessa and Ad Adiabene in Semitic language are connected roots. And the prophet Adai that goes to those places on which the, uh, our friend Thaddeus is based, also is connected to that ed, ad, root. And Semitic language, as you probably know, a few others in this room will appreciate, Dennis probably understand, he's done some Semitic languages, that it's all based on root. So if you get an ed, an ad, in anything, whether it's adai or edessa or adiabina, you're getting a related language complex. So I think these things are all connected. How and why, I, I don't have the answer. But uh, Queen Helen, according to Josephus, is converted to something resembling Judaism, but it's a peculiar form of Judaism. The person who converts her, of course, was who? Ananias. He's the hero of the Agbarus story, too. He's the intermediary between the J Jerusalem apostles and the King Agbar in Edessa. And there's another companion with him, an unnamed companion in Josephus' antiquities, and I think that person is Paul. Why isn't he named? <laughs> you know, there's problems here on certain characters, I guess. He has a second unnamed teacher, and they are both distinguished by the fact that they say circumcision is not required. And that's Paul's position in the letters and in Acts. So, 
Queen Helen is not converting to a normative form of Judaism according to the picture in Josephus. But then other teachers come from Galilee and find her children reading the Bible, as we told you. Two of her offspring who later become kings of Edessa. One called Ezad, I think he's called King Ezad of, of Edessa. And he feels you should circumcise. Because the teacher says, do you understand the meaning of what you're reading? They're reading Genesis 17, where Abraham circumcised all his household. Immediately that God made the promises to him. You can read that passage. They run out and circumcise. It's all about circumcision. I hate to keep on about it. You think I'm obsessed with circumcision, which I'm not. I never think about it outside this class. <laughs> it's just that this literature is obsessed with it, not me. Is it Eliezer? Yeah, it's Eliezer from Galilee. Yeah. And he... Um, obviously is a zealot or a sicari or whatever. He's a forcible circumciser. He's a sicari. He's called him a zealot, call him an extremist, call him whatever you want, call him party of the circumcision. He teaches a different gospel, if you want to call it that. And they run and then they circumcise themselves. And then they're the ones who do the famine relief. And that's how Paul is going to be, uh, uh, Paul's missionary and uh, later activities are going to be introduced within the context of the famine relief. So again, I would go there. I would put Paul and Ananias among Queen Helen's famine relief agents whom she sent to Palestine. As it's presented here, or her sons, or Agbris, or whoever is doing this famine relief. Uh, as it's presented here, it's the church in Antioch. And that bears on what Antioch? We all agree now that that's an issue. You understand this now? And I make special difference to my friend here because she's familiar with these areas more than the rest of us because her ancestors came from there. And uh, so she knows how important those areas to her, her and her culture framework really are. And to my mind, they're very important too. I think that this is the cradle of mo most of this material. And they don't even know themselves, to my mind, how important <laughs> what went on in their areas are. They're not even aware of it because they've, uh, they've uh, absorbed a more orthodox view of them. I'm sure her teachers or priests or uh, religious people are, are, they know it's important, but they're not important uh, aware of how much because their view is more orthodox than mine. Okay, in any event, um, we're finished with that. God gave repentance life to the Gentiles. See, there's an actual, um, there's an actual um, logic to all this. After all this, now we're ready for the missions. Because line, it's not the end of the chapter, but 11.18 says God gave the uh, gift of repentance of life to the Gentiles too, so the church is ready to go. And there we go. So there was a big scattering that took place. Then Stephen, after the death of Stephen, uh, they ran away to Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, and they're preaching the word to no one. Ah, they still admit all, only, they only went to Jews, because of course that's what Galatians said they were supposed to do, only to the Jews. But they just said that Gentiles too. And then certain ones of them were from Cyprus and Cyrene. I don't know what to make of all these things. And there were Hellenists who were preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus. None of this makes any sense to me, and I'm not even going to try to make any sense, because I said Hellenist, to my mind, is a code name because the Hellenists object to Paul, and I can't understand why the Hellenists are objecting to Paul in the earlier, and that's why he flees Jerusalem, supposedly. So the Hellenists, to my mind, are the Zealots, but uh, here they're called Hellenists. And many turn and were believing, so that's the glue area there. And then Barnabas went to Antioch. And this is the beginning of activities in Antioch. Now the question is: Isn't Antioch in northern Syria, uh, in uh, on the coast? What the most people think Antioch is, uh, capital of Seleucid Syria. Uh, I've drawn the map last time. Or is it Antioch further inland, Edessa? I say it's Edessa. And you say, how do you know it was Antioch? Read Strabo, the Greek geographer, and uh, um, uh, Pliny depended on him, the Roman geographer who died in the eruption of Vesuvius, and he'll tell you that. Antioch, that Edessa was originally called Antioch. Okay, and a uh, whole year they gathered together the church and taught. And then prophets came down from Jerusalem, line 27. I don't know who all these prophets are. We read about Ananias. Didn't we read about Ananias, the prophet who was tortured to death? 
I think this is what this, these prophet things are based on, that Ananias, although here he's called Agabus. And in my work, there was never a prophet called Agabus, and it's more garbling of maternal Agabus. And the text is showing you that it's working off the Agabus legend. But of course, it's mixing it all up. Now you're beginning to see why I, I, I draw the conclusions I do. It's mixing it all up about some prophet called Agabus who, 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 who predicts the famine that was then over the whole world. That's 45 AD, according to Josephus or thereabouts. And uh, they wanted to send relief. Agabus is going to appear again in Caesarea. He's going to warn Paul not to go to Jerusalem for Paul's last visit. We'll get to that's chapter 2021 of Acts. We're getting there. And uh, the disciples decided to send relief to the brothers. Hope I have not enough time to cover this because we're at a good point here. I hope I'm not boring you too much. Uh, living in Judea, it'd be good if you had a Bible because then you could follow the, the points. You wouldn't look so uh, conf you know sad about my uh, things. The best to have a Bible so you can mark it up and find these things so you can check it out yourself later and see what you think on your in your own time on it. Anyway, the disciples are now called disciples, uh, and they want to send relief to the brothers in Judea. So we're in a famine relief situation. But Queen Helen and Agabus and their sons are not being mentioned. And they send to the elders Barnabas and Saul, because they're in the community in Antioch. So the community in Antioch is a Pauline community, according to this book here. And Ananias is, of course, very important. By the way, I think Agabus also relates to Ananias. Agabus is a, is a general garbling of different things, but we'll leave it. Well, chapter 12. We're going to go to Paul's famine relief mission to Jerusalem, right? Everyone got their Bible in front of them? Is that where we're going to? Wrong. We're not. We should, but we're not, because Acts doesn't follow a rational pattern. We're sending them up to Jerusalem, <laughs> but it doesn't tell us about the mission. I don't want to get my usual you know, cynical self, but I don't think there was such a mission as Acts describes. There was a mission. But Acts doesn't know what happened in the mission because it, it doesn't describe the mission. I do think that Barnabas and Paul probably are part of Queen Helen or King Agabus' entourage, and Ananias too, in all of Syria. And they are involved in this famine relief activity. But don't forget in Galatians, Paul said he left Jerusalem and not, did not return for how many years? What if, I don't know what date you give the Galatians uh, or Paul's conversion, but um, let's say he converted at the um, earliest in 36, 37, if you want. So he didn't return until 50, 51, according to him. You'd have to, if you want to credit the 14 years, you'd have to have Paul converting in 31 A.D. You know, and that's when Jesus was supposed to have been crucified. Uh, so, you know, you got some date problems here. He said, he, and, he, and he doesn't say he comes back to give famine relief in Galatians. Uh, I've read that stuff. Anyone off the page here? Anyone don't, hasn't looked at or remember I read that to you? It's in chapter 1 and 2 of Galatians. So I left, I was unknown by sight, all they knew that he had formerly persecuted the church, you know, and so on, but the churches in Judea didn't know who I was. And only Peter and the Bertrand's brother in the Lord, I only saw them among the apostles in Jerusalem. And I didn't come back for another 14 years. And I came back, not because I was called back, but because for fear that the course I was running or had adopted would not be allowed. And I came to put the course that I had adopted before these pillars. Not that they're important for anything to me. I don't consider them important. Uh, um, James, Kephas, and John. The central trump for the leaders of the early church. Later he speaks about Peter, but at that point he speaks about Kephas. So I don't know if it's Kephas and Peter. They're the central three. And then we realize that this is James, the brother of John, of, 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 of um, Jesus, not James, the brother of John. But Acts 12 begins with James, the brother of John. That's the first time we've really heard about James, the brother of John. Because we know if we're going to go up to Jerusalem, we've got to get in touch with a um, James. And if we're going to get in touch with a James, we know it's not James, the brother of John. So we've got to get rid of James, the brother of John. And that's what Acts 
uh, chapter 12 does, right here at this point. At that time, Herod the king, whoever he is, there are two possibilities, Agrippa I, from the uh, work we've done, and Herod of Chalk is Agrippa I's brother, who takes off after Agrippa I dies under mysterious circumstances. All this is in where? Josephus. Unfortunately, you got to read it if you want to know, but if not, you've got to take my word for it. But the problem is, Acts 12 ends with Herod dying, line 21. Herod dressed up in royal clothing, sat on a throne, making a speech, and he looked like a, an angel, not a man, and he suddenly fell over dead, being eaten up by worms. Uh, well, I'm not going to credit that as very historical either. You must forgive me. I, I'm not being kind. I, I apologize. I can't do anything else. This is not history here. This is okay for literature, but it's not history. Okay. But that's clearly supposed to be Agrippa I. Because Agrippa I, Josephus says, dies while posturing, looking like a god on the stage. And suddenly he keels over and he uh, looks like he's been poisoned or something's gone wrong with him and he dies. So, that, uh, so that's not the other Herod of Chalcus. That, so there's two possibilities here. And they were all called Herod, so Herod the king doesn't tell us anything. And why were they kings by this time? This is not Herod the Great. This is 40 AD. 41, 42, 43. Why were they kings? Because when, and it's getting complicated, Tiberius was uh, uh, died, I don't know, I forget if he was assassinated or not, and Caligula took over, Caligula and his uh, cousin, uh, Claudius, it's all in the I Claudius uh, series if you've ever seen that, were very friendly with Agrippa I who they'd been brought up with in Rome because Herod had, uh, had sent him to Rome to be educated because he was the daughter of his Macca the son of his Maccabean wife Miriam, or uh, the grandson of her. He had Maccabean blood, he had royal blood. And so when they were so impressed by this Agrippa, Herod that they called him, that uh, he had helped them get the emperorship that they sent him back as king to Palestine like his grandfather and like his Maccabean. So and when Caligula came on, Agrippa I was appointed king, not just tetrarch, ethnarch, whatever. And that's in the early late 30s, early 40s. So that's what we have. So Acts is accurate here, but anyone reading this wouldn't know one Herod from the other, right? They're all Herods and it's just unclear, and I'm not surprised believers are confused. Anyway, he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, i.e. he beheaded him. And all oh, the Jews liked that, line three, according to Acts, of course. And he was going to seize Peter, too. And it was the time of the unleavened bread, and they put Peter in prison, and then uh, Peter, an angel, helped Peter escape from the prison. I'm hurrying here because my time is running short, line seven. And then uh, Peter gets out of prison and uh, the guards are ultimately executed for having let him go. Remember, you'll see later in Acts that Paul has a chance to escape from prison. And a miracle occurs and an earthquake happens and the building falls down or the walls fall down. It's in Asia Minor. And what happens when Paul is presented with that opportunity? Well, he refuses to go because he doesn't want to get the guards killed. He's superior to Peter. Now, that's what the narrator in Acts wants you to He's a real Christian. Uh, so anyway, well, regardless, he doesn't escape from prison. Guards are not killed. Uh, you'll have to decide how much of these stories you were prepared to entertain them and not that you're prepared. But in any case, he hurries, and he goes to the house of a new character, line 12. Mary, the mother of the Lord... Mary, the mother of James and Simon and Jude. Mary, the mother of God. Mary, the mother of Jesus. No, Mary, the mother of John. We've never heard of either of those two people before. A new character has suddenly intruded into the narrative. Now, you either accept that or you feel there's a problem. My only reason I think it's a problem is because he goes to this person Mary's house to do what? 
to leave a message, line 17, aside from the knocking and the, and the Hellenistic women that are living there, Rhoda and a lot of other Hellenistic names and so on. He's knocking on the door and the message, go tell these things to James and the brothers. What? James and the brothers? But, 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 what James? We haven't met any other James yet. I've introduced you to James. But you don't know any other James, theoretically. You follow me? Right? Why, well, but the other James has disappeared. We got rid of him right at the beginning of the chapter. By the way, we're on the famine relief mission here, supposedly. So Acts is tidying things up a bit here. The authors of Acts have changed gears. I'll keep you a little bit because I'm enjoying this. I got on a, on a good roll here. My friend is here and he helps me feel good So because uh, I know that uh, some students like me. <laughs> some don't. But the point is, I feel on a roll. So, let me so, so uh, uh, you know, you, you, have, you don't know who this James is. You got rid of the other James. But we're on a famine relief mission here. And when, so far, I haven't heard a thing about this famine relief. Axe is tidying up rough edges here. It knows James has to come in. He's going to come in in chapter 15, and he's going to come in in chapter 21. So go tell these things to James. It looks like James has already been introduced to us, right? That's what Axe looks like. Anyone disagree with that? Because Axe should have said, well, uh, this James was the leader of the church. Uh, he was uh, sub at least succeeded Peter. He was the brother of uh, Jesus. Uh, you know, he took care of things while Peter had to leave because Peter had escaped from prison under a death sentence. We would have expected some narrative material like that, wouldn't we? A normal narrative? No, we don't have a normal narrative. Because Acts doesn't want to tell us all those things. Or, and I think this is more the case, it already did tell us all these things, but someone erased it. And I told you when, I know you didn't like me doing that, I told you when I thought James was introduced. At the time of the elections to succeed Judas the Sicari. And then hang everything on poor Sicaris. They're the, they're the guilty ones anyway. They're the most hard people because they're the revolutionaries who cut people's throats. That, that's Judas Iscariot. So in any case, whatever it is, the death and the uh, succession to Judas Iscariot is as I told you, takes the place of the introduction to James in the, uh, whatever the initial material was. Now, now it may or may not be, you know, may not like that theory, okay, give me a better one. Why doesn't Acts tell us who James is? And how come Peter goes to marry the mother of John Mark, two characters we've never heard about before, to leave a message from for, the, for James and the brothers? Wouldn't it be better if he went to marry the mother of James's house to leave a message for James and the brothers? No. Someone theologically didn't like that Mary should have a son called James. That's my explanation. So the theologians have already got a hold of this, and we have a new presentation. We now have a new character to deal with Mary's mother, John Mark. Okay, I gotta hurry up. He leaves the message. Uh, 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 James is finally introduced. We know he, who he is because I've been telling you for about fifty times about this guy. No one else has told us. Now I mean, even believers know who he is. And as you say, you go to your churches and they won't even know who this guy is. And why? They'll be totally confused because the other one was beheaded. In any case, the next thing we hear, line 25, the word, uh, after Herod is eaten up by worms, the word of God grew and multiplied. That's the glue. The narrative continues, right? That's how we get on to the next episode. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, having completed their famine relief mission, bringing with them John Mark. That's why John Mark was introduced. But what? What happened in the famine relief mission? You got me? So all this was supposed to be about the famine relief mission. So something else has been put in the middle of all this about the famine relief mission, and the famine relief mission has gone. In any case, there's a problem with the narrative. A final point, chapter 13, by the way, is now going to go on to the church in Antioch. There are certain prophets and teachers at Antioch, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius, probably Luke, Menaean, probably Ananias, Herod, the Tetrarch's foster brother. We're going to talk about that next time. We already have to some extent. And so on, the church in Antioch. But before that, one last point. Who was beheaded in Josephus at this time? At the time of the famine, all connected to the famine and uh, Queen Helen's uh, uh, famine relief. 
Theudas. Theudas. Thaddeus. Judas, the brother of James. Why do I say Thaddeus? Surname Lebaeus. Why do I say Thaddeus, surname Lebaeus, is Judas, the brother of James? Because in Matthew and Mark, he's Thaddeus, but in Luke's apostle list, he's Judas, the brother of James. And I say to you, Thaddeus is the same name as Thaddeus. And I say that who's really been beheaded it is a brother, but it's another one of the brothers. It's Judas, the brother of James, who's beheaded here. In the wake of the... He's the Theudas. Anyway, it's too complicated, but that's why I was emphasizing Theudas. We'll pick up that next time. I hope you find it interesting. You can certainly run circles around anyone you know in your church with all this data, because they don't know, they won't know what you're talking about. And that's always fun, isn't it? So I may be a bad person, but the stuff is fun to have, to, to have a hand on, don't you think? Because you're going to look like a genius when you go back to wherever you talk to about this. They won't even know who the Otis is. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. You've been to graduate school. Am I wrong there, uh, Dennis?